Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. You know, we love to talk about the customers who love us. But what about the ones who hate us? What do we do with those people? Let's get into it on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone once again to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a peek inside the brain of a customer who's considering a purchase decision, trying to figure out what's going on in there. We believe that if you understand your customer well enough that you can then reverse engineer your sales presentation accordingly. And today we're going to look at some of the dark side of our buyer's mind. Buying is about emotion, and sometimes that emotion goes negative. So how we handle that upset customer is just critical, especially in this day and age, as we'll see in today's episode. Uh, Joined, as always, by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Hey, Murph, this is a topic that we don't even really like to talk about all that much, right? I mean, hug your haters, really? Well, and the place we hug our haters is in social media. I mean, I I work in YouTube and, uh, you know, YouTube people share comments that are just brutal. um, And yet you need to Mm -hmm. find a way to respond to them in positive ways, right? But it's it's interesting that the that the avenues that people have today are so broad. I mean, it used to be you know, way back in the day, you had to write a letter, right? <laughs> you might be able to make a phone call, but basically, you know, you wrote a letter. And you can still do that uh, today, although I, my guess is that that's probably fairly rare. But you can go directly to a company that you're not happy with. But then you've got social media, right? And so you can tee off on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, or, as you mentioned, you could uh, create an entire YouTube video just for the purpose of of letting somebody know, not just letting somebody know, letting the whole world know how upset you are. And sometimes those videos go viral, uh, the most famous of which is probably the United Breaks guitar uh, guitars uh, uh, video. Uh, but it, it's really interesting how how much people are willing to uh, vent their frustrations in a very public way. Well, and, you know, you think back to the days when you would write a letter, you, you'd write it, and, and typically that would get your some of your frustration out and you might reward it and and tone it differently now that we have such an immediacy to it uh sometimes uh we're we're lacking the filters we need when we're putting those things out there yeah that's a really really good point uh you know uh, uh, blasting something online is probably akin to saying what's on the top of your mind when you're in an argument with your significant other uh it might feel good in the moment but you're 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 probably it's probably not the wisest thing you could say very very interesting well let's get into our quote of the day and i'm going to quote uh, today's guest jay bear uh, who is the expert on this subject of how to hug your haters and he says before you go spend a bunch of money on marketing make sure you're at least decent in your category of customer service because because otherwise you're just running in place. That is such great advice. Awesome advice from Jay Bear. We spend so much money and time and effort on how we get noticed that we sometimes forget just what people will actually notice. And what they will notice is the way that we are taking care of them, or in many cases, not taking care of them. So before you go spend a bunch of money on marketing, make sure you're at least decent in your category of customer service. I just really love that thought. I love that idea because it talks about our priorities. It talks about how we do things in the right way and in the right order. So we make sure that we can provide the service that we want. It's ultimately going to be the best benefit to our customer. And that leads us right into our sales tip of the day, which is to make customer care a higher priority than marketing. 
make your customer care a higher priority than marketing. And right now I'm talking to individual salespeople. I'm not talking so much to companies, although it applies very, very much to companies. But right now I'm talking to individual salespeople. What can you do to make customer care your highest priority? Because when you put a higher priority on customer care than you do on marketing, something amazing happens. Your customer care becomes your marketing. And it's the best possible type of marketing. You take great care of your customers, and you know what they become? A whole sales force just for you, where they are out there letting people know how great you are and the wonderful, wonderful opportunities to do business with you. So ask yourself, what can you do today to increase your level of customer care? Well, I first met Jay Bear at a National Speakers Association convention, and then we ended up attending a workshop together uh, in December, and I got to spend some time with him. He's brilliant, no doubt. He's also just a really good guy. Uh, the author of several New York Times bestselling books, including Hug Your Haters, Utility, and several others. He's the founder and president of Convince and Convert. That's convinceandconvert.com, a company that helps organizations with their digital marketing and customer service initiatives. He's the host of the Social Pros Podcast, one of the most popular marketing podcasts in the world. He is a popular MC, an event host, and a world-class speaker, and I'm proud to call him a friend of mine. Please welcome Jay Bear. Jay, how you doing? Uh, I'm living the dream, Jeff. Thank you for that kind introduction. Fantastic to spend a little time with you. You're, you're a writer, speaker, MC, strategist, uh, podcast host. Uh, are you just easily bored? How does one get involved in so many things? And are you sometimes being uh, accused of being unfocused? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I tend to add things one at a time. It's almost like a reverse onion effect, and then you sort of look back and say, "Wow, I got a lot of things, uh, a lot of things going going on here." I certainly didn't get into all those things at, at once, but you sort of add add something every quarter, or add a couple of things each year, and you sort of look back and say, "Wow, there's a uh, there's a lot of my plate." But I do get easily bored, so I would have it I would have it no other way. You know the the old Stephen Covey quote: "The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing." How do you define your main thing? You know, it's interesting. It's changed a little bit over time. The the Convince and Convert blog is sort of what started all of this. I, I I created this company about ten years ago and started writing blog posts, and they became popular. And the the blog sort of be, beget the first book and the book tour, and then doing speaking and then the podcast. And, and the blog is still really important to what I do and what the company does. But as people's consumption has changed, how they how they take in information has shifted over time. The blog remains important, but now we put a lot of emphasis on the podcast and and webinar and videos and things along those lines. It, it just, it's a different world now and, and, and sitting down and reading a blog or an individual blog every single day, it's just not a behavior that happens with the same level of intensity or concentration that it did even five years ago. You suspect that trend will continue? I do. I'm very, very bullish on uh, on podcasting and audio in general. In fact, I just finished uh, writing up the the top blog posts of the year on my site, which I do each year and kind of look and see what, what really resonated with the audience. And for the second year in a row, Jeff, the number one most popular thing that I wrote was uh, statistics around the increase in podcasting and podcast listenership in the United States. Hmm, hmm. What about video? Uh, we, we, we see... Uh, obviously, the proliferation of YouTube is is it that was that stopped being big news a long time ago. It's just it woven into the fabric of our life now. Uh, but do you see more and more people moving towards self-produced videos? Yeah, absolutely. Especially short form. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's uh, Facebook videos, Instagram videos, even videos on Twitter, and now videos on LinkedIn, uh, you see more and more what you would consider to be kind of off the cuff, just grab your phone and shoot it uh, type videos and, and things that play out a whole narrative in, in six to 20 seconds, which was unthinkable just a, a few years ago and now is very much uh, commonplace. And, and look, you know, a video touches more senses than, than, than the written word ever can. It's just the nature of the medium. And so when you can create video competently and consistently, you are going to resonate with people disproportionately. And I think we're starting to see that. It's, a, it's an interesting um, sort of observational scenario that I have here at home, Jeff. I've got a, a teenage son, he's 17. Uh, he's very much of his generation. He's a big sports fan, as am I. And so it's quite commonplace that, that we will be having breakfast together at sort of the breakfast bar here at home. 
and we'll both have our phones out, of course, and and we'll end up on the same page on ESPN.com. Mm-hmm. And I will be reading the story and he will be watching the video of the same story because ESPN almost always has a video and then uh, a, a written account. And for me, it's just so much more comfortable and so much more natural to read. I grew up that way. Mm-hmm. And for him, his his philosophy is, why would I read this if they're going to give me a video? Under mm-hmm. what circumstances would I spend time reading this? And as an author, I, I got to tell you, that's a trend that may not uh, <laughs> may not portend success in the future. Yeah, we may we may have moved from the written book to the audio book to the video book here. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I actually I'm working on a new book right now, and I actually thought about that. We may do it, my co-author and I, for this project. We may think about a companion to the book, which is a, a series of videos. It is almost a video version of, of the book. I haven't quite fleshed out the idea, but but I think it's very much on trend. You had said the the idea that we're just going to grab our phone and just record something. Uh, I think there are a lot of sales professionals out there who are a little concerned that they can't do that uh, particularly well. And, and my, I want to see, you don't have to agree with me, but I want to throw this out there and see what you think. My sense is you're working with a customer, you know, you're, you're selling, you know, whatever it is. You're selling, I don't know, diamonds, it, it, cars, vacation homes, whatever it is. And uh, you've just met with this customer. They leave. Grab your smartphone, shoot a video, and the fact that you've done it personally for them and you're doing quickly far outweighs. It completely trumps the idea that it's going to be a little shaky and your hands moving a little bit, that your customer is quite okay with the very uh, unpolished, uh, sort of raw version, uh, but it's still going to stand out so much more dramatically than any email you could ever send. Absolutely. And I make use of that constantly in in my business. We use a tool called Go Video from a company called Vidyard, and it's 100% free. It's a plug-in uh, onto your browser extension on your laptop. So almost everybody's laptop has a camera in it now. Mm-hmm. So if I want to send an email to a prospect, maybe somebody's interested in having me come give a presentation, or maybe they're interested in consulting, I will click that button, talk right into my laptop, say, thanks very much for your inquiry. Really excited to work with you. We're going to be in touch in 20 minutes, uh, you're going to hear either from me or our head of business development, boom, press the button, goes in the email. And as opposed to just a one sentence email or a voicemail that they may or may not listen to, Mm -hmm. uh, it actually warms it up and and makes it much more authentic and human. So I I use that multiple times a day, every single day. It doesn't require a camera. I already have one in my laptop. It doesn't require a tripod or dry ice or lasers or a video (laughs) production company. I think most folks who are shy about video are manifestly overestimating the quality of the video necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yet uh, there are off the shelf programs that are making it easier and easier to be able to do quality video, but I guess if nothing else, uh, everybody else is going to do it. Everybody else is already doing it. If you want to, this is not the type of thing that you want to be last to the dance on, right? I don't think so, unless you've got some sort of better mousetrap in mind mm-hmm. that you are incubating, and that could be true, but most likely is not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way I look at it is just just test it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you send somebody an email instead of a voicemail, and that email includes video, and you get a better response, well, there's your answer. Right. And and it's not going to cost you really anything uh, to give that a shot. Let's talk about the the uh, the body of your work, and I want to start at thirty thousand feet here. T- tell us about the shifts in customer care that you are seeing, especially in light of the rise of social media. Uh, it's crazy. It, it's changed everything. It's why I wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hug Your Haters came out in uh, early 2016. And and I, ha- I didn't really set out to write a customer service book. I am a marketer by, by background and by training. But what was happening, Jeff, is all of our corporate clients at Convince and Convert were asking us not just for advice on um, marketing in the social media age, but also how do we handle all these customers who are who are complaining in social media or asking for help or advice or counsel? You know, we know how to answer the phone and we know how to answer email, but there's all these other touch points now that customers want to have with businesses, and they were really flummoxed by how to excel there. And so I did a bunch of research and and found that wow, the shift is is colossal and is is changing business forever. And and the big move on the chessboard, Jeff, is that now. Uh, an increasing percentage of all company to customer interactions take place in public, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Yelp, TripAdvisor, et cetera, et cetera. And that means that all of these interactions have spectators. See, for, for generations, business has had it pretty easy because all the interactions with customers have mostly taken place in private, mm-hmm. face-to-face, phone, letter, fax, email potentially. 
And now you've got all these public interactions where not just the customer uh, at hand can determine, well, how is this company handling this problem? But a bunch of other current or prospective uh, customers are also looking on. And so that changes the financial ramifications of customer service, certainly changes the process and procedures by which businesses need to uh, engage their customers in these in these new channels, and has also resulted in a lot of shifts in resources and organizations. For example, one of our clients is Comcast. And Comcast has gone from 13 full-time social media customer service personnel uh, to 400 in, in about a year and a half, wow. because that's where customers want to interact. It's just faster and easier for them. And I assume a, a huge majority of those people are doing nothing but responding to what comes across the line. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, for them, it is it is the new telephone. And it's an interesting scenario, Jeff, because it's one of the few times in business, this shift to social media customer service, it's one of the few times in business that benefits both sides equally. So customer prefers that. Nobody spins the roulette wheel of contact mechanisms and lands on Twitter and says, okay, and people pick Twitter because they like Twitter. They pick Facebook because they like Facebook. Um, and, and so the customer is is voting for a particular channel based on where they contact the business, but it's also more cost effective for businesses, dramatically so, to interact with customers in social media versus phone or email, it's just faster. So it's it's less expensive for business and it's more satisfying for customers at the same time. And that one plus one plus you know equals three uh, equation almost never happens. So it's an it's an interesting scenario. Hmm. Explain off stage haters and on stage haters. So I did tons of research for the book uh, and, and surveyed thousands of Americans about the science of complaint and discovered that there's actually two very different types of complainers, two different types of, of haters in the parlance of the book. The first are, are onstage haters, and onstage haters complain in public. So they choose to utilize channels like Facebook and Twitter and Yelp and TripAdvisor, things that are in public. These onstage haters are slightly younger, slightly more tech savvy. And, and what they really want in many cases isn't necessarily a reply. It's an audience, right? They, they want their friends to say, oh, that's terrible. How, how horrible for you. Sad face emoji. Conversely, you have the other group, the offstage haters, the offstage complainers, and they tend to use legacy channels to complain, so phone and email most commonly. They're slightly older, slightly less technology savvy, and they very much want an answer. If you call, you expect to call back. If you email, you expect an email back. It's a very transactional form of, of communication with the company. And so it's important to understand these two groups and and change how you interact with them accordingly. For example, if you leave a review on TripAdvisor, for example, of a, of a hotel, a restaurant, an attraction, you don't necessarily expect and anticipate that the business will respond to you. Uh, about 45% of Americans expect that to occur. So when you do get a response, it's like, oh, wow, these guys are really on top of it. That's amazing. And it's a real opportunity for business now to exceed customer expectations in that area. To, to reply when people don't expect a reply really can give you some extra credit uh, in that customer's mind. Hmm. When we look at customer satisfaction rates, I, I, my guess is you and I've never talked about this, Jay, but my guess is that you probably roll your eyes at least just a little bit when you hear a company tout their customer satisfaction rate. Is, is, that, is that a good guess? Well, it depends. I mean, certainly a high customer satisfaction rate is better than a low customer satisfaction rate, but but those systems are gamed so often and, and companies are measuring the wrong thing mm -hmm. so consistently. Here's, here's an example. Uh, if anybody uh, listening has ever purchased a vehicle in the last, I don't know, three years, you buy a car. The last thing the sales representative says to you as you're leaving the lot is, hey, you're going to get a JD Power survey in a couple of weeks. What can I do right now to make sure that you give me all tens? Mm -hmm. Happens all the time, right. right? Because that individual and the dealership are bonused based on JD Power scores. Now, that's not the right way to collect customer feedback. It's not the right way to run a business, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. What they should do instead is bonus the dealership on percentage of completed surveys. Right, because praise is massively overrated, Jeff. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I will tell you that praise is the most overrated thing in business. In fact, it may be the most overrated thing in life. Because when somebody says to you, oh, you're so great at this, oh, you're so great at that, it makes you feel 
tremendous, mm -hmm. but it doesn't teach you anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, because you already know what you're good at. Everybody already knows what they're good at, whether it's individuals or businesses, it doesn't matter. And, and so to have that ratified is psychologically satisfying, but it's not illustrative or educational in the least. So what makes you a better business person, what makes you a better marketer, what makes you a better husband or father or friend or colleague is in fact, negative feedback and criticism, which is why good companies tolerate negativity mm -hmm. and great companies seek it out. Mm -hmm. And that's why car dealers as an industry are doing it wrong because what they're trying to do is say, tell us how great we are. And what's the point of that? Right. Uh, advertising, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, that's it. They get to put it. the little JD Power. Of course, they pay for the right to do it, but they get to put the little trophy there in their ad. Yep. I, I can't think of anything else. Yeah. Talk about the practice of uh, essentially blowing off those uh, really expressive haters. So, so you know, we see the well, we have a you know a ninety five percent customer satisfaction rate, and I listen to that number and I go, okay, so ninety five percent of the people don't hate you, but five percent clearly do. But but yeah. what we what what do we find? We find people over and over again that look at it and say, well, you you know, you just can't please everyone. And you suggest that we should. I think I'm going to use your words here, answer every complaint in every channel, every time. But what about the okay. guy who's just clearly wacko? Okay. Because that person in many cases has spectators as well, especially if that complaint happens in, in public, Twitter, Facebook, um, Yelp, TripAdvisor, et cetera. You should answer everybody at least once. Now, if that person generated, you know, if it's obvious after you respond that that person doesn't want help, they just want to vent, well, then it's fine to, to move on. In fact, I have a rule called the rule of reply only twice, which says that you never interact with the customer more than twice in public. There's no good comes of that in, mm -hmm. in any scenario, but you should answer everybody. There's this idea that, well, what if this person is a troll uh, or something along those lines, that, they, that they're a miscreant, that they uh, are somehow uh, out to get you? Well, that may be true, but you don't know that until you respond to them. That you can't make that assumption based on their initial complaint. Mm -hmm. You are you are making leaps uh, of of faith based on incomplete information. So you you should answer everybody uh, because it proves that you care and that you're listening, and the spectators uh, will reward you for it. You know, as somebody like you who travels extensively, there's always going to be something that goes wrong. You know, a, a hotel room gives your reservation away or, or an airline messes up on something. And uh, it's it's interesting because at that point, when I'm lobbing my uh, frustration over one of the social media channels, the, mm -hmm. the fact is that I'm not a troll. I, I'm I'm not necessarily looking for attention but I'm really upset. And so I'm going to say something that in, in a conversation I probably wouldn't have, I probably will not say the same thing the next day. But at that moment, I'm throwing out there uh, something that uh, has really, really tweaked me. And the issue that we're going to deal with is those people, when they're lobbing that complaint, especially over social media, there's a lot of emotion at, at mm -hmm. play at that, at that time. Some might suggest to look at it and go, well, give them a little time to calm down before you respond. You look, I, I have a feeling your counsel is going to be the opposite of that. Yes, for this reason. Uh, the data show that many people who complain in social media do so as the last resort. They have tried phone. They have tried email. They have been unable to uh, find satisfaction either because it took too long or they just didn't like what they heard. And so now they're taking it public as, as sort of the Hail Mary pass mm -hmm. of customer service. And, and so you have to understand that many of the customers reaching out through those channels are, are egregiously unhappy. And, and so you should respond to them as quickly as possible, partially because they may already be twice bitten and also because the expectations are different. In the research for the book, we found that 40% of customers who complain in social media expect a reply within 60 minutes. Now that's that's pretty quick. So some businesses, of course, that's fine. They can do that all day long, but many cannot. An hour is a is a pretty tight turn in most circumstances. But that is what the expectation is of consumers in that channel. Of course, their expectation in phone and email is somewhat longer, mm -hmm. and and so you do have to understand that if somebody goes to these venues to complain, they probably want to hear back from you pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, it I will just take this directly from the book, though. You say that from the research that you did when you were writing Hug Your Haters, 
just 32% of social media complainers are happy with how fast businesses respond in that channel. This is despite the fact that 63% of social media complaints are addressed within 24 hours, and you suggest that's just not fast enough. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was fast enough, but I think we are living in the Uberization of everything, right? When I can press a button and, and have a car show up or food, you can get anything in the blink of an eye now. It's almost like the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. So to say, okay, I have a real problem with this business and they're going to get back to me tomorrow. It just not it's just not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's get down to, the, to uh, some one-on-one -on -one here. You interviewed uh, Gary V. Gary Vaynerchuk on your podcast uh, some yeah, some on. months back, and uh, you discussed the concept of the currency of attention. It's a concept that I just uh, absolutely love. The very um, thought of paying attention and and attention as a limited resource is the shortening of attention span online translating into the same phenomenon in face-to-face -face interactions between a customer and a company? Oh, I think it is, absolutely, uh, that, that, that it's all bleeding together. You just think about how people use the web now and how they use social media. It's so interwoven through the day. It used to be much more session-driven. Like, I'm off work, I'm going home, now I'm going to spend some time on Facebook. Now it's you dive in, you dive out, you dive in, you dive out. So, so those expectations and those norms are absolutely uh, bleeding over and it and it impacts all forms of business, not just customer service, but the entire customer experience. And what we talk about a lot with with clients is that customer expectations are liquid now, meaning that they transfer from industry to industry. You, you can't say, well, we're in a particular company, say retail banking, where customers haven't historically expected us to be as nimble. Customers don't care anymore because they're judging your retail bank or your car dealership or your restaurant versus the kind of service and customer experience they get from Uber and Nordstrom and Ritz Carlton uh, and Amazon and everybody else. They're not going to give you a pass anymore because of, of your industry or category. It's just not going to happen. Hmm. Do you, uh, when you're working with your clients, these huge corporate clients, do you recommend a strategic a connection between social presence and face-to-face -face presence. So in other words, if, if somebody's listening to this right now and they're like, hey, um, I'm not even allowed to go on Facebook while I'm at work or Twitter or anything else. They, they don't, my company has said, stay off social media, not just for wasting time, but because we want to manage our, our voice online. Uh, and yet that customer, before they walk through the door, has probably had some interaction uh, on social media before there is an, an actual physical face-to-face face encounter. So what do you do here to make sure that you're consistent between your social presence and your face-to-face -face presence? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard enough to have a consistency between social media and email <laughs> because most of the databases and systems that you use to interact with customers in those channels are not interoperable. Uh, that's why you, a lot of times you'll, you know, you interact with a company in social media and the first thing they ask you is your account number because they've got to go try and look you up in a different database. Uh, same thing with the phone, trying to match phone to social media is almost impossible. It's a real challenge for business. Face to face is a colossal challenge because, you know, if somebody walks into your retail shop and maybe they have uh, said something to you on your Facebook page, it's not like you can dial it up in your point of sale system and say, all right, let me see what this person has said on the Facebook page in the past to get sort of a quote unquote account history. Mm -hmm. It's just not really possible today, at least not easily possible. So, um, you know, the, the only thing you can do in, in especially in small businesses is, is, and, and we recommend this is like, look, if you've got frontline personnel who are working in a retail environment in a restaurant environment, make sure they have some sort of access to the internet, make sure they have a tablet or something at the front desk so that they can occasionally monitor and see what's going on and try and get a feel for, uh, what the lay of the land is. That's about all you can do because the, the software solution that ties it all together is just not really here yet. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not uh, at, the, at the small and medium sized mm -hmm. level. What about the little guy? What advice do you have for, for, for doing social if the person is a, a, a solopreneur? You just have to carve out time. It's like going to the gym. You have to say, look, for 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, at the same time every day, I am going to methodically, consistently, strategically 
go through all the different contact channels that that customers might have with our business that are beyond the obvious phone and email. So I'm going to every day look at Twitter, every day look at Facebook, every day look at Instagram, every day look at ratings and reviews sites and discussion boards and forums that impact our business and our category. And I'm just going to take time to do that. And then I'm going to commit to answering every person in every channel every time. There's some great case studies and examples in the in the book of that. One of my favorites is uh, a, a lady whose name is um, Debbie Goldberg, who runs a, a franchise, small franchise called Fresh Brothers Pizza that she owns uh, with her family. They have 14 locations or so in Southern California. She personally answers every single review on Yelp, TripAdvisor, Facebook, etc. She does an interesting thing, Jeff. If, if somebody uh, leaves a negative review, you know, one star review had a bad experience. She says, oh, we're terribly sorry. Uh, that's that's not how it usually works here. Uh, but you raise some good points. Listen, if uh, if I sent you a gift card, would you give us another try? If somebody leaves a positive review, four or five star review, she says, oh, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to let other people know about your experience at Fresh Brothers. Hey, listen, if I sent you a gift card, would you bring somebody with you next time who's never been in before? And it changes how people think about the business considerably. She gets people walking in every week who say, I came because I saw how you handled that person on Yelp. I came because I saw how you handled that person on TripAdvisor. It helps propel her business forward. And I asked her when I interviewed her, I said, well, geez, Debbie, um, this is interesting. I love how you spend time on this. I love how you answer them personally as the owner. I love how you, how you encourage them to come back. But you know, what's your gift card budget? This seems like an expensive proposition. She said, it's it it's, doesn't matter. So number one, we 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 do make a list of who we've given gift cards to. So it's not like one person's getting thirty gift cards or something. Mm -hmm. But he said number two, who cares? Mm -hmm. If I can give somebody a ten dollar gift card, they come in and buy twenty eight dollars worth of pizza and bring somebody else with them. That's the cheapest form of marketing I could ever do. And in fact, my interview with Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, he said the same thing. Uh, he said, look, if you could give somebody uh, coupons, uh, you know, low dollar coupons, and encourage them to come back. We'll do that all day long. Mm -hmm. Like, where do I sign? It's much more efficient and effective than than doing advertising. And just to be clear, my guess is that when she gets a hater on Yelp who uh, sends a negative review, she's probably making that offer regardless of whether or not there's any. Uh, she's not going to make a judgment call. She's not going to weigh this out and say, "Well, that person has a legitimate concern." She's probably just a point blank to everybody out there. Absolutely. If we gave you a gift card, would you come back? Because, because again, what Debbie understands and everybody needs to understand is that, yes, of course you want to make that customer happy, but where the real revenue opportunity is, Jeff, is in the spectators. Mm -hmm. the, the potential customer value of all the people looking and reading that review over the next one, three, six, 12 months is so dramatically larger than the revenue opportunity of that one customer. You are on stage in customer service now. Customer service is a spectator sport and everybody has to act accordingly. Hmm. Love it. Great word. Uh, just about out of time. What's next for Jay Bear? What, what is on the horizon for you? Just finished the first draft of my new book, which will be out October 2nd, 2018. Uh, it's called Talk Triggers, the Complete System for Getting Your Customers Talking with Word of Mouth, all about word of mouth marketing and how to do things dramatically different in your business that create conversations. Lots of really fun examples and case studies right in it with my good friend at Daniel Lemon. So that's uh, that's the big project uh, right this second. Also, uh, you mentioned my podcast at the open. Thank you very much, Social Pros. Uh, we are uh, just getting ready for the big celebration. It'll take place in a couple of weeks, episode 300 of the show. So yeah, we're very, very yes. excited about that. That's great. That's great. Uh, and yeah, we'll have to have you back uh, closer to release date so we can talk about the next book there. It's, it sounds like a fun topic. Uh, last thing, uh, give us a quick life philosophy. You, you, you mentioned you've got kids. Uh, one day they're going to say, you know, the old man used to say, uh, yeah. What did the old man used to say that would be uh, beneficial? I love this question. This is this is fantastic. Uh, I actually am looking at it right now. I have a sign in my office. I'm, it is, it is, I can almost touch it. My mom gave this to me years and years and years ago when I started my very first company. And it says on it, except that some days you're the pigeon and some days you are the statue. <laughs> 
Well said, sir. Well said. Uh, that's Jay Bear. He is the author of uh, Hug Your Haters, as we've been talking about it today. Uh, I want to make a suggestion to you sales managers who are listening right now. Uh, go buy that book in, in bulk. Get it to your sales team, and you're going to have sales meeting material for months to be able to go through chapter after chapter after chapter. It's really, really good stuff. You can also find Jay on uh, convinceandconvert.com. We'll put that in the show notes. And yes, don't miss his social pros podcast it's really interesting it's it's one of those podcasts that just gets you thinking differently and uh, we just need more of that in our uh, hectic crazy world uh, my uh, strong thanks for a, a really really great time thanks for being on the show jay bear oh jeff is fantastic to be with you thanks everybody for listening i really appreciate it all right murph uh smart guy yes yeah, no, and I liked a lot of what he had to share. I had some great takeaways uh, that I'm going to be able to use as I'm trying to interact with uh, companies that uh, I want to share my opinions with. Were you kind of surprised at the whole concept of how aggressive Jay is and in, in the thought of going after people who just don't like you? Because it's, it, look, human nature is going to look at it and say, oh, you don't like me, therefore stay away. And, and uh, his clear suggestion, no, 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 lean into those conversations. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think one of the problems that we have is, uh, and you've mentioned this before, it's we want to be comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we get out of that comfort zone, when we start leaning into those things of, okay, what could I do better? What, you know, tell me the things I'm not doing well. Uh, that's, that's where we improve. And I, I think that was a great point. Yeah, I love the idea. He says that that the increasing percentage of customer interactions take place in public, and that means spectators. It's a very interesting idea that uh, customer service is a spectator sport. That the real opportunity is even not in the way that you handle the person who is not happy with you, but in fact how you <laughs> how you appear to those people who are just sitting back and casually observing uh, the interaction. That's a really interesting take. Well, think about how many people leave a review on Yelp or mm -hmm. uh, for their Uber driver, right? It's a, probably a small percentage because most people don't want to take the time. So mm -hmm. obviously, when you do respond, uh, people are reading those reviews to find out whether or not they want to take advantage of the service you're offering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also really interesting to me that the way that people are judging us is uh, they're judging the experience is that they're judging against the experience that they have elsewhere. And so uh, as I'm looking at it and the way that companies do business, one of the big issues that we have to deal with, and I think we oftentimes we have our head in the sand about this, is that we're thinking that it's just about this interaction, the interaction between me as a representative of an organization and you as the customer. If we have other organizations that are responding to their haters, are responding to people who are, are, are really negative uh, in a much better way than we are, then what happens? It's, it's setting the expectation for the way that I want you to interact with me. And so I, I just want to encourage people and challenge people to look at it and say, the bar is being raised every day by companies who are doing this right. What are you doing uh, to respond to that? But I, I want to encourage you to carry this conversation forward. Send the podcast to somebody else and say, hey, listen to this episode with Jay Bear, and then let's talk about it. Uh, if you're a sales manager, have everybody on your team listen to the, this this particular episode, and then talk about it at your next sales meeting so that you can you can unpack this and you can look at it. You can say, hey, what, what are we what are we doing here, and, and are we doing this right? The fact of the matter is, as Jay Bear just said, uh, customer service is a spectator sport. People are watching the way that we interact with the people around us, and they're making significant judgments. And it's not just a matter of whether or not they're going to uh, uh, give us a, a negative score on a review somewhere. There are customers there who have never done business, but they're watching, and they're watching the way that we handle people, the way that we take care of people, the way that that we respond to people. So there's a whole audience out there that wants to see how we're going to do this. And I want to encourage you, lean into that. Look for those opportunities then to, uh, to, to really embrace that. And I think it'll make a profound difference, um, not just in the way that your company is viewed, but in that single interaction that can make all the difference in the world. 
Well, there you go. Another episode of The Buyer's Mind. If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe to that. Would really appreciate that. Leave a review if you wouldn't mind too. But that's another wrap on our podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, my friends, go out there and change someone's world. We'll be right back.